are you all? So, obviously, uh, this kind of leads me on to this week. It's a pretty heavy weekend in drumming, in the drumming world, in the rock world. We are not going to have, it's all going to be heavy here. It's going to be light and positive. Um, Adam sort of surprised me with that clip. I didn't know it was coming. I thought we were going to have the usual podcast intro, but we don't. Um, I have to say, fairly mega. Yeah, I, I, I think so, man. Like, it's it's that shows just how much Rory loves his band and what he did uh, for his job, you know, like laying down rad beats and grooves. He's, t- he's, he's fucking chopped his chops on there, man. Right. Did he, did he do a solo, like, both times? Because I've never seen them, uh, ashamedly and unfortunately. I've I've never I've never seen them, um, which is rubbish. But I would have loved to have seen just even just seen half of Life Is Just Not Alive. Oh, okay. Are we not? Do we not have mics going on? What's going on? Oh no. Hang on. This is not good. Is this not? Can you hear us at all, guys? There is no sound. Magic. Um, what if we just use the inbuilt mic on the computer? Will that work? One, two, two, one, two, anything? One second, guys. We're just uh, trying to fix it. One second. One, two, 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 two. One, two. One, two, one, two, one, two. Can you hear us? Can you hear us now? Hopefully, hopefully you can hear us. Um... If you can let us know, that would be magic. Ah, oh, cool. Now you can hear us. Great. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we'll start Thanks again. Yeah, we'll start again. Welcome. Um, like we said at the beginning, um, obviously rough and sad times for rock and roll, but not going to be rough and sad, going to be super positive. Um, and Adam was talking about the times that he had seen the Foo Fighters live. So, um, yeah, let's, let's have that again. Well, yeah, so... Um, obviously, as Chris, I will reiterate, um, bit of a heavy weekend for um, rock and roll. Losing Taylor Hawkins. Yeah, totally. But you you were talking about you've you've seen them live. So yeah, um, still not much of Adam. Okay, hang on here, Adam. Just use this. Hello. I don't know why that's happened. That's I mean that's all showbiz, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, so, I mean, goes without saying, Taylor Hawkins is quite potentially one of the best drummers I've ever seen live. Um, he's just amazing, mm-hmm. just absolutely amazing. Every time, the, the two times I saw him live, the solos that he brought out were just mind-blowing. Obviously, they did the theatrics of it. They did, like, you know, lifting him up. They did... Um, the whole kind of making sure it was interactive and all that, but man, what a player! What an absolute boss! Yeah, I can't hip to him like the nineties when he was playing for Alanis before he joined the Foo Fighters, um, and I had got really into Alanis's first album, uh, and all of the footage that all the live footage that was coming out at that time that was on MTV when back when MTV actually showed gigs. Um, and, and live music, it, it was Taylor playing. I was like, who is this dude? No one had heard of him really at all. And then you start finding out in the magazines it's this, this guy called Taylor Hawkins. And he was just super impressive. Amazing groove, amazing energy. Um, just all-round fab rock player. And then I found out about him even further when he joined the Foo Fighters on what is my favourite Foo's album still. Um, there's nothing left to lose. Um, I think to- you could totally hear 
that he kind of, this is going to sound really weird, but he kind of like freed up the band a little to just be able to do slightly different things, you know? I don't know if, if you agree with that or not. I don't know what you think. <laughs> this, 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 this is just so bizarre. I don't know why that's not working. There's no reason for it not to be working. Anyway, um, I mean, you and I have spoken about this at length. I think Nothing Left to Lose is my favourite Foo Fighters album. And more specifically, my favourite song on the album is Aurora. Not even because it's all, like, I mean, Taylor's known, or was known, for being quite a frantic, you know, brute force behind the drums. You can see that in any picture of him you see playing live. He's always been like that. If any, if, you, if you've if you been fortunate enough to see him play live, whether it's on video or even in person, you know, just so much energy, so much absolute incredible energy and articulation um, and his playing and all that. But in that song, Aurora, it's just, it, it's phenomenal because it's just, it's a pretty, by all accounts, it's a pretty like kind of middle of the road Foo Fighter song. But the groove is just tremendous, absolutely tremendous. And just the way he plays, the snare sound he pulls out, absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so good. Yeah, agreed. I think it's my favourite song as well. Um, it's kind of just one of those kind of unexpected. From a band like that, you don't expect that kind of that kind of song. But the more you listen to them, the more you listen to guys like Dave and Taylor talk, their, their sort of love of melody and, and their love of songs like that is, is really obvious. Um, I think... Probably after that, the the sort of intro to In Your Honour, um, the beginning of that record, that drum part, straight into, um, uh, is it uh, No Way Back? Yeah. Just that segue between those two tracks is just absolutely mega. Just a ridiculous way to start a record. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> it's not, it is lighthearted. Anyway. Um, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think. What was your first? Was that was? It, there's nothing left to lose. Your first experience of hearing Taylor, or was it Alanis? Alanis. Uh, yeah, Alanis. Back in the sort of uh, just before about ninety five, ninety six, just when sort of the because she he was on the Jagged Little Pill tour. Mm. He didn't record the record, um, but he did the tour, um, and that was like all the videos. Like I said, all the videos that were floating around at that time of all the of her live was was him playing. You know, and like she would release when she released a single, she would release uh, B sides like, and there would be live versions, and he would be credited on on it. You know, that's how you would find out who was playing. So that was kind of it. Um, I'd heard the Foo Fighters, I'd heard um, Monkey Wrench, and all that was huge. You know, before he was in the band, but uh, yeah, Alanis was the first time. Guy, you tell we one thing we 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 really want to do here, guys. Is, is sort of interact with you about this because it's not really just about us. Um, please feel free to tell us what your favourite um, Taylor track is, if you've seen them live, if you've got any cool stories about them, because I think it's really valuable to, to sort of to do this kind of thing with a guy like that who's had such an impact, who's had such an impact on young people. Like Travis Barker's story about him was amazing. I don't know if you saw it. Um, when sort of Blink were just coming through or Travis was playing in smaller clubs Taylor would turn up at his club these club gigs to watch him and tell him like you're going to be a star and Travis was kind of like knocked out that guy at that level would come and see him and sort of these really dingy basement shows you know it's pretty special and I think as well like Foos have always been like that even not just with guys like Travis Barker obviously at the time Travis Barker was still at the beginning of his career but even now like I've read so many things about Dave and especially Taylor would stand at the side of the stage and watch mm -hmm. all their support acts, watch all the younger bands play. Um, in fact, I think when they played Glasgow the last time I saw them, um, I think it was a, a Glasgow band called Honeyblood who were supporting. Um, or no, they weren't supporting, but they were playing on the same bill. Um, and they were all like, they shared videos of them hanging out backstage and all that. It's really cool. Like, And I think Taylor was always a champion of just like l supporting the younger musicians supporting the younger drummers you know i don't think he did many clinics or anything like that but i guess what would you say he was really a clinic he get kind of guy or i don't know that that was his vibe but you know he, he was doesn't like he was like you said still super supportive i know like mark juliana who's out playing drums with st vincent right now as much as he's known for the jazz thing he's that's what he's doing and they supported foo fighters recently and, and taylor was hanging out with mark and his son um, who's like who's getting into playing and getting into music and just being super cool and accommodating even like tiny tiny kids you know it's just pretty pretty rad. Um, what's Pat, uh, Peter saying? Uh, um, um. Yes, I caught him on the Alanis as well. 
what is he saying? Uh, uh, another huge loss to anyone who plays, who loves, plays, listens, and just looks at drums. Wholeheartedly agree. Just what an inspiration. Yeah, and he's like, no, you know, he, he wasn't scared of sharing, sharing things like his influence. He was a massive Roger Taylor fan. He got to interview him, I think, for Rhythm Magazine. I think he, years ago he was an editor. He did one. He, he edited an issue and he, he spoke to um, Roger Taylor. I can't remember. I think I want to say the other guy he spoke to was Nick Mason from Pink Floyd, but I, I can't remember. It might have been Phil Collins. Um, I, I can't. I can't remember. Dave is saying he was an absolute machine. One of the nicest guys. He gave Cat Miles of Honey Blood his china when she broke hers. That's right. She Cat shared that this weekend. Um, she's out on tour with Katie Tunstall at the minute. For the people, for the people listening at home, um, uh, the story is uh, Taylor was an absolute machine. He's one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. He gave Cat Myers, who's a local Glasgow drummer of Honey Blood, his china when she broke hers, and he regularly gave gear to drummers of support bands. Just amazing gesture. That goes to show that it's it, it's you know it'd be quite easy to think of a band of the foos level. That that kind of thing was completely off limits. It's mm -hmm. like no, that would like you would never find that. That would never happen. Mm -hmm. But Taylor's just like sees it how it is. Like okay, someone's stuck here. I can help them. So you know, I'm just not going to be above anything. Yeah, totally. And and you know, the, the, he's got sort of known for being welcoming over all of it. You know, like like you say, nothing's off limits. The it's, it's, the hang is just as important to these guys as, as the music is and I think that's why they become so loved and so revered because they take the music super seriously and they, they can, I mean, his he's playing speaks for itself. I don't care what anybody says, you know, he's, he was tremendous. Um, but also just being able to sort of hang out with people and not not make it super starry. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a superstar, I'm untouchable. No, he's really approachable and really cool, and and like even still, like did his own thing with his own with the coattail riders, and it wasn't just all necessarily about Foo Fighters. He was, you know, he had other sides of him that he wanted to showcase. I think did that tremendously well as well. Totally agree. This is really awkward that we're having to share a microphone. <laughs> Um, Ewan Barker says a very humble guy who never seemed to brag about how good he was. Always played it down, which I loved about him. Totally agree. I mean, I've never. Taylor doesn't protrude the guy like the aura of like, oh yeah, I know I'm great. Like, he just kind of, he just plays the drums. You know, he just totally plays the drums. Nathan Meadows, our Nathan says, Taylor was the epitome of the drum face. He showed every hit in his facial expressions. 100% agree. Yeah, if you're going to play a show like that, if you're going to play big rock and roll, man, you're, going to, you're entertaining people as well. And I don't think he left anything on, like, you know, sorry, he left everything on the stage rather. He didn't hold anything back, you know, I think. What they do like two and a half, three hour shows. Like when when you see these guys, and so they they were just constantly playing and and just con and because of the love of it, you know. I think that was excuse me, that was really evident as well, you know. Um, absolute machines. I, I remember seeing things like the video for the Pretender when it came out and just being like, you know, guys at that age still still caring and still after, even after the sort of twenty year career, they're not phoning it in. They're still trying to push it, or they would do things like. You listen to Skin and Bones, and it's more or less all acoustic. You know, the sort of only live album that they put out isn't the big showy rock album. They're still trying to get after it, and still trying to, you know, what else? How can we do it differently? He started adding in concert toms to his kit. Do you remember when, like that? That wasn't always there. It used to like the, the nothing left to lose. Either. I was pretty sure a four piece or a five piece, like one was it one up, one down. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, you're talking about the kit. No, 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 like, like the kit he would play would be like one up, two down or one up, one down. Um, and then as he gets on, he's still trying to find new sounds, you know? Well, for me, my, my kind of example of that would be the first, not first time I got introduced to Foo Fighters, but the first album I bought of the Foo Fighters was a, an album called Wasting Light. Um, and this is when I was very early on just getting into Foo Fighters and just when you learn about how they recorded that album, like they purposely didn't record it to a computer, they didn't record it to anything, they recorded it literally just to tape. Mm. So obviously the logistics of recording things to tape is everything's got to be right first time. You know, and there's a documentary called Back and Forth, which is one of my favourite rockumentaries all the time, if you, of all time even. Um, if you've never watched it, I 100% recommend that you do so because it's just an inspiration. It's like an hour and a half, and after that, if you don't want to play the drums, then something's wrong. 
Um, anyway, so they show the recording of Wasting Light and that, and you know, they, I don't know if they do it on purpose, but they make it very obvious, like, that, that Taylor's also human. Like, I mean, there's like, they're halfway through a great take, and he breaks a drumstick, mm. and the guys are all like, oh, sake you know he's like sorry sorry but you know then you know the, the following take after that is like the one that's on the album yeah. and like you can see him like we've all been in those situations in the studio where we've listened back to our snare drum or we've listened back to something and something's just bugging us about how we've played but it stays in mm. and like you see that happen with taylor you see him like sitting talking to pat smear and he's like oh there's just there's one snare hit in this one particular song um, that I just I, 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 every time I get to it I'm just like oh I wish I could do that again but I can't re-record it and like Pat's like obviously like kind of being Pat and he's just like oh you're going to hear it on the radio all the time and he's like oh that snare hit you're always going to hear it and he's like oh yeah so like you know I loved it just how like oh yeah I made a I made a mess of that guys mm. you know but and he very much owns it it's the kind of thing that could be fixed mm. quite easily but he's like no it's uh, like it is what it is you know yeah. I think that's really cool Um, just amazing amazing guy what do you have? I'll start off mine. Do you have a favourite track performance of his? Mine is the song Low. Uh, I can't remember the name of the album right now because um, it's the one with times like these and all that on it, isn't it? Um, the, the, there's a fill in he plays after the break, a kind of bonkers single stroke roll fill in that comes completely out of nowhere. And just the, like the Tom groove is absolutely mega. Like the whole track for me, top to bottom, is. is played absolutely perfectly and you do know that he's taken he's done it in one go man that yeah. that's probably not been dropped in because you can hear it move you can hear the tempo move it's never clicked they were i think they, and dave's book they talk about that they never recorded anything to click i don't think it was all live you know um but yeah that for me is um thank you you and one by one um is that for me is the the drum track of his you know for me it's got to be the song rope Oh, really? Off wasting light, yeah, because obviously there get there's there's moments in that where Taylor gets brief drum solos, but mm. he's just like he's totally on it. Like um, the drums just sound incredible. I think his playing just is is really powerful. I think in that song in particular, um, it just comes across really powerful. The other song I think is really great for his off the same album was White Limo. Right. White Limo is a phenomenal. Song. It's just balls to the wall rock, mm. like just fast, you know. But Taylor's playing on it is just. Flawless, mm -hmm. absolutely flawless. Love it. Um, Ewan, uh, the, pop that one up. Yeah, Ewan, I came across the Gannon Arnold project on YouTube at the weekend. If you've never seen it, it's a must. I have that DVD, man. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and I, I totally forgot that he was part of it, actually. Um, the whole thing with uh, for, for context for people, Gannon Arnold is a fusion guitarist. Guitarist? Guitarist. guitarist? A fusion guitarist? <laughs> no, he's a fusion guitarist. And he does this project where he takes the same song and he gets five or six different drummers to play it. So Taylor is one, Jimmy Chamberlain's one, Gary Novak, I think Simon Phillips or Terry Bozio, um, and a bunch of like superstar drummers all play this track. And it's really amazing how you can hear all their personalities come through just this one track. And then they all do like, um, they all do another track. So they, they're all at least on one, because he, he, only, he only picked one player from the album uh, to record that track. Um, and then there's like another six or seven albums. So yeah, we'll find that um, and link it uh, somewhere later, because um, it really is cool to check out. It's it's, it's worth a um, it's worth a, a look. Callum McPherson, have you seen him do Y Y Z with Geddy and Alex from Rush? No, actually haven't. That will be amazing. Um, yeah, Dougie, he was passionate, humble, and amazingly talented musician. I still can't believe he's really gone at 50. He was a big influence in my drumming as a young drummer. He'll be sorely missed. Seemed like a lovely guy to R.I.P. Taylor. Indeed, mate, indeed. Um, so, yeah, that Gannon Arnold thing is, is really worth a, a look. So we'll try and find that and link it. Bob's Drum Lessons uh, has said, never got to see Taylor live, but studio playing was a big influence on me. I think it was a big influence on a lot of people, you know, especially like, when I was in college, I did a study in a lot of Taylor's playing. You know, obviously Dave's as well, but from it, there's nothing left to lose onwards. You know, it's just it's predominantly Taylor that plays on all the tracks. I think maybe Dave plays on a couple of them, but just it's the guy. He's the he's one of the guys. If you want to be a incredibly professional rock drummer, he's the guy you need to study. Him and Dave, you know, and you know, it's quite a. I guess for Dave, it's quite a tough loss because he's lost a great drummer as well, you know? Oh, yeah, I mean, imagine being the guy that, that comes in to, 
to sort of take his drum throne at his request, you know, pretty bonkers. You've got to be pretty talented to do that, given, you know, Dave's history and Dave's ability. So, yeah, and, and Addy's best pal. But, yeah, um, Callum has linked that YYZ, YYZ, YYZ. Um, so we'll maybe share that later as well. I, I won't, we won't watch it right now, dude, because it's obviously not going to be like two minutes long, you know. So um, and it's probably worth um, just spending the time on. But yeah, we'll we'll, we'll link that and, and, and let people see it. Um, does anybody else have anything like like your favourite tracks of Taylor's that you you want to talk about or share? You know, um, yeah. I, I, as a studio guy, just his ability to sort of lay it down too is is you know there's. Never any, it's going to sound like a strange thing to say, but there's never any fat on the play and it's always to the point. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, it's exactly what's needed for the tune, but also has his touch and has his flair and has his little kinks in it that, that make it him, you know? My, another, just, I was looking at it just there. Um, when I saw the Foo Fighters in Glasgow, and I'm pretty sure some of the followers of Drummers Only have also been to that gig or were also aware at that gig, um, a song that they've not played live in so long, a song called Stacked Actors, which opens the album, There's Nothing Left to Lose, and just Taylor's playing on that song is phenomenal, but I really noticed, you could tell, like, experienced Foo Fighters fans in the crowd, because as soon as Taylor kicked into that groove, everyone knew exactly what was going on. It was phenomenal. Grant Anderson has said, uh, Taylor was an amazing drummer and a very nice guy. Any drummer who gives their spare equipment to schools and community centres is amazing in my book. Fantastic frontman to R.I.P. Taylor. And then Douglas McFarlane, or Dougie as we know him, says, I remember reading his interview in Rhythm Mag in 96-ish uh, when he was touring with Alanis. He spoke about his love for that Phil Copeland played on the take near the end of Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic. Um, he said he was going to strive to recreate moments like that. I... 100% think that he has in yeah, several I mean, times. I mean, spoke yeah, spoke about it. Spoke spoke about about it. <laughs> um, stacked actors. You know, um, and Callum McPherson was at the same gig, said, hey, Johnny Park on the same set list yeah. that night as well. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and that's not, you know, that's taking someone else's groove and, 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 and making it yours again, you know, just the, the sort of calibre of the guy he, he was, you know, absolutely amazing. Cool, man. It's a pretty solid chat, a pretty solid loving. Thanks for taking part, guys. Appreciate it. You know, it's obviously he's, he's it's going to affect a lot of people um, because he was, you know, music's one of these funny things. It's all, it's kind of um, the, the the emotional connection to it is obviously quite big, you know, and and and, and people grow up sort of attached to these drummers and this music. So it's, it's it's really cool that you're sort of taking the time to take part, you know. So um, thank you for for checking it out with us. We really appreciate it. Um, Apologies again for the technical delay at the start. Um, yeah, just I think it, it speaks volumes when bands who were gigging over the weekend had subtle, whether it be subtle or not so subtle tributes to him on stage, whether it be like drummers saying, you know, like um, I love Taylor or whatever, or Taylor Hawkins or whatever on their drum heads, or like Sam Fender. I know when he played Glasgow, he did a, a big thing about him. You know, he had a big projection. Um, ben Benji Talent. Oh my god, I always get his name wrong, but the drummer from Royal Blood, um, he did... Um, Thompson. Ben Thompson, thank you. Um, he um, he did a drum solo and had, you know, a photo of him and Taylor because they toured together. Um, you know, lots of things like that. I think it's just it goes to show that even, like, you know, not just drummers mm. respect him. You know, lots of, like, different front men, you know, like um, like Alice Cooper and everybody who, who was involved with him in some way. Mm. You know, amazing. So thank you for everyone joining in. Um, for this this Taylor Hawkins loving mm -hmm. you know yeah. very much well needed cool so yeah um, Adam bring up the, the card and we'll, we'll take everybody home so um, thank you as Adam says thanks guys um, if you need anything from us you know where to find us um, Glasgow on the phone 0141 429 3799 and Leeds is 0113 244 2183 if you wait <laughs> I'll start that again because I wasn't prepared for you handing me the microphone <laughs> Um, you can email us at info at drummersonly.co.uk or if you need leads, uh, it is leads at drummersonly.co.uk. Uh, don't forget, we, uh, if you want us on the socials, it's at drummersonlyuk anywhere. So Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, anywhere you, anywhere you want, at drummersonlyuk. Um, obviously, as you're listening to it, we have a podcast and we usually do have two normal working microphones when that happens. Um, and we have a new episode coming out tomorrow. 
And lastly, don't forget, if you're down anywhere near Liverpool this weekend, we are at the UK Drum Show um, with the wonderful guys from Ludwig. Um, so Adam will be there, Jake from Leeds will be there. Please feel free to stop by the booth and say hello. Um, thank you again for checking us out. Um, go listen to Foo Fighters, go listen to Taylor. Take care and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.